The title of this sermon is A Healthy Church. I really say that. So some of you have heard this whole Faith Avenue thing and the Love Avenue and the Hope Avenue. So I'm going to try to introduce it so that you get a little bit more understanding about what it is today. There's a scripture, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. You know, this is where Paul was writing to the Corinthian church, which was, they had some challenges going on. And Paul was revealing certain things and messages to them. And we use them today in our modern church as guidances for how churches are to act, behave, and are counseled. And the verse says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And then the verse does close with the, with the greatest of these as well. So here you see the three items that are in the avenue, faith, hope, and love. There are avenues. So Grace Community International, that's our, our denominational kind of fellowship that we're part of, many years back needed to provide a framework for how we or the denominations and the fellowships live out their life in Christ, in this body of Christ that we're in, in this fellowship that we're in. And they put together this paradigm of avenues. Now, this isn't to say congregations haven't been acting these things out and doing them, but sometimes it helps for people to have a framework to fit all of these things into that we can talk about and that we communicate. And a paradigm is a road to get onto the avenue. So one avenue is the Hope Avenue, which is where we as people in the body feel the hope of Jesus Christ. And we have that hope now, right? As all of this drama plays out around us. We have the hope in Jesus Christ and that keeps us anchored and secure. And we don't let all these other things around us take that hope away from us because the evil one doesn't want us to have hope. Jesus Christ, our Lord, wants us to have hope. The other avenue is the faith avenue. And this is where people go deeper in the faith of Jesus Christ. Eric, you mentioned that, getting closer to God, understanding where my faith comes from, where it's going, how I use it, how I display it. Where is it? And the other avenue is the love avenue. And this is where people, we experience the love of Jesus Christ. So with that kind of framework, I think we can sort of see, okay, we've got avenues for hope. We have avenues for faith. We have avenues for love. And they all bring us to Christ. So here is another pictorial that puts the three avenues together with a pastor. And you heard this before where we've mentioned a healthy ministry is a team-based pastor. I had to add pastoral because as many of you know, we do not have a pastor. We have a pastoral team and I'm so thankful for it and we are thankful for it. So I just added the A on there to make it we are pastoral team led. The key to a healthy church is this vibrancy in the three avenues, 
or in other words, think about the actions of the environments that are noted here that you can see in the circle. And at the center is this pastor that's providing this collective glue to guide our fellowship through these areas where we are guided through the Holy Spirit. And through the leadership of the pastor, or in the case of pastoral team, disciple making ministry occurs. It's a way to glorify, to provide glory, the glory of the Father, and building this kingdom of God. And so you see the hope, which is the worship, the love, which is the witness, and the faith, which is the discipleship. I know the font is tiny, but I'm just trying to read it out for you so that you can see it, all guided by the Holy Spirit. Now, just to continue, I'll use a term in my work area. We're going to double click into, <laughs> into another area here. So the Christian discipleship is the disciplined habit of thinking and acting in Christ. Discipleship is growing closer to Christ and more like Christ and deeper into the Christian community with other believers. Continuing with the faith definition, it's where we create the space where disciple making and spiritual growth can be nurtured. This faith avenue is where community is built through relational and spiritual formation activities. So each of the avenues has a definition, and this is the one for faith. And when we go deeper into this faith avenue of discipleship, there are these three components. And I'll repeat that it's not that we haven't been doing these already in some shape or form. It's just about trying to crystallize what we are doing in this community that we're in with the congregation members that we have. And there are three areas, church life. Don't think of it like the church life that like Eric gave. It's a different kind of way of thinking about church life. Connect groups and cross-generational care. And then we'll have a little moment where we'll just reflect on those. Church life could look like, these are just examples for you to explore and think, because I'll be asking you about them later. We could do one-on-one -on -one mentoring. And we've done some one-on-one -on -one mentoring. There have been occasions where we, in this fellowship, have actually had sessions here. I think they might have been piggybacking off kaleidoscope or something like that. But there's mentoring opportunity. We have so much to give. God didn't create us here just to be in ourselves, but to give back, to share, to help others grow. And sometimes one-on-one -on -one mentoring would help. Now, mind you, one-on-one -on -one mentoring is not limited to just the faith avenue. It can be in other avenues as well. But this is one place where it can manifest itself. Retreats. I don't know if any of you have been on retreats. I actually did a, a woman's retreat here many, many years ago. It was like a one-day woman's retreat where we were in a group with some other ladies and all of us on different journeys along our faith and path to Christ. And these are dedicated moments where we can share our lives and our understanding. There are camps. We mostly think of camps for kids, but I believe there's camps for adults too. <laughs> so camps are another way to do it. Now I'm not a, a nature person. Um, if my hands are in dirt and I see a worm, I'm, I'm done, I'm done. But there are other kinds of camps where you, know, you can get in there and, and, and share the knowledge with other people and commune with nature or in some other kind of camp setting. We all like church picnics. We have, we have done them in the past. 
COVID hit, et cetera, that slowed down a lot of summer things. So we we did have church picnics, and I think we enjoyed them a lot. And even when we met to say goodbye, we say goodbye to Kyra. I think we, we met on the common, and that was sort of like a little picnic. And then when Pastor D left, we had another little picnic or sharing. And it, these times of coming together with others, celebrating joys or goodbyes or comings or whatever, graduations or whatever, these picnics, whatever, however you term them, whatever theme they have, they're about church life and interacting with each other. They're game nights. These are just examples, right? Getting together and having Bible Jeopardy. We know we can do that on Zoom. I've done enough Zoom Jeopardy things, games with people that we could easily throw one together and have everybody participate. And then there are what could be unique ministries to our fellowship in the community where we are. What could those be like? And those would be tailored for specific needs for who we are and where we are. So let's consider how do we spend time with our church family? Not meant for you to answer it right now, and maybe we can use this during our reflection time at the end, but consider these thoughts here. There's going to be two more of these, by the way, so just prep yourself. How do we spend time? Should we do these things? Are people interested in these things? Are all age groups being appropriately served? Now, I know we look at our fellowship and we, we don't see a lot of toddlers, little ones, elementary, high school, because our the way the flow has happened in, in our particular church, it's, it's moving up to a, an, an older type of group of people. But even those individuals might not be appropriately served. Or maybe everybody is. I think of my online community out there. And how are they being served? And we are so blessed to have this forum where they can participate if they cannot be here. And they are not in the state of Massachusetts or they're away in the western part of Massachusetts, where it is really an hour to hour drive. It's not the best convenient time to, to get here to be in prison. So how are we? interacting with them. Do we have pathways to engage any new believers? I'm not exactly sure what we have um, in this area. I know our denomination does have some vehicles to disciple new believers, and there were a couple of new people to our fellowship that came and I don't think we offered them anything to like say, welcome to our, our denomination. Here's some information for you. And we should probably work on that for us and thoughts to consider. Next is connect groups. And this is probably an area where when I was anointed, tapped, voluntold <laughs> to be the Faith Avenue champion. This is probably the area that was most focal for me when I became the Avenue Champion. It was all about having a space for relationship building and spiritual growth. Gatherings where bonding can occur and life on life discipleship happens. I do that through the Bible studies that I, that I lead. It's something that I was guided to, the Holy Spirit taps on your shoulder and says, hey, I think you should do this. And then the Holy Spirit hits harder on your shoulder and say, I think you should do this. And finally, you just get a full right out punch. And that's kind of what happened to me. Um, I was doing a lot of my own individual Bible studies, and I think the Holy Spirit just said, what's wrong with you? You should expand this out to others. But my nature is, is not random. I don't know if any of you look at me and think I kind of looks like a random person. <laughs> I'm a pretty structured 
kind of I go about things in a structured, organized kind of way, framework to shape as you think. Now, there were other Bible studies going on, as many of you know, Pastor, you had Bible studies, and he had his own style, and I had a different style. And you know what? That's the beauty of the body of Christ. It allows us all to have different styles. And so my style didn't conflict with Pastor Keith. And it meant the needs of other people who want a little bit more framework to their Bible study and a little bit more framework discussion. So this is how I got connected to the Faith Avenue. But others could also have ways of having a connect group. We do Zoom connect groups a lot. And <coughs> bonding can happen. Bonding does happen. The Holy Spirit comes in, and I've seen it many times on the Bible studies that I've led, and I'm sure the ones that Pastor D had when he was here, people bonded, bonded together. And that's the disciple making. That's faith happening, growing additionally. So consider what types of groups does our congregation and target community need? We are, for all intents and purposes, a commuter church. There are a few people that do live in Waltham, but for the most part, we are a commuter church. That means we commute in. We drive in, bus in. I don't think we train in. But we come together through various reasons, if anybody wanted to understand the historical journey that we're taking why are we here. We can explore that, but we are a, for all intents and purposes, a commuter church. But we are in this community. And for some reason, the Lord has said, I want you to stay in this community. So here we are in this building with you in this city. But what types? What's the, what's the need here? Are we digging into the written and living word of God? I know and many of you know, as soon as you step out of the word of God, you go into some way weird places. And having spoken to other people who may not have a, I'm sticking into the word practice, they go into some weird places mentally, et cetera. And it's not a good thing. And the Lord has already told us we should meditate on the word. So how are we providing, continuing to provide opportunities for that with others? Our facilitators and hopes being developed. Like I said, I was tapped, the Holy Spirit nudged, then shoved. Are you being nudged? Is it gonna take a shove for you? If you need help in any ways of being developed in this, understand that failure is just a step on the way to success. Nothing starts out boom, bam. Some, maybe sometimes it does, but that's not always the case. Remember the mustard seed, right? That goes into this great blooming tree. We need to start small. Why? Because we make mistakes. We're human. And we need to fail. And therefore, we can look to God and know who really was in charge. So consider these things as you reflect upon how we can do additional things here in our Connect Group area. The last is cross-generational care. And this is an interesting one, and it became very clear to me when we have our, for those who did their five voices assessment, you figured out if you're a connector, a nurturer, or a guardian. I think there was one other one, I can't remember right now, but if you were one of those, I know Jody is a natural connector, and she was drawn towards Oh, how we need to go to Daniel. We need to do something for him. And so in a way, that was like an in-home visit, right? With a member, somebody who can't be with us. How do we extend ourselves to these in-home visits? Most of the time we think about this as shut-ins or elderly care visitations and things like that. The interesting thing about this, we will all pass this way. We will all by the grace of God, be elderly, 
and would surely appreciate somebody visiting us who we actually know, <laughs> who maybe we actually fellowship with at some time. So this is just a thought, a seed to place in our minds of how can we do something here that isn't in an emergency situation. And then there are these other areas where we have some sort of ministry of outreach and what that could be, I'm not sure. We know at the greater fellowship level, there are certain women's ministry opportunities and there could be men's ministry opportunities. I'm not aware, I'm not as clued into that as maybe a, a, a male pastoral person on the team would be or somebody um, at the headquarters level. But I wonder if the faithful men in our fellowship want to get together, have an interest to get together, to share and discuss. It's just an option. So let's reflect here on what to consider. When I look at our fellowship and I look at who's here and what their needs might be and thinking about the journey that they're on, it makes me wonder, and maybe you too, what kind of cross-generational care opportunities exist? What are the needs of the different stages? See, Eric? stages of life that we have in our congregation. I will not always be this peppy person that I am. Um, I know that I will change because our bodies are decaying. It is the way our Lord has designed us to be in this earthly form until we take on our glorified form. And so each day, our bodies tell us, you are changing, you are in transformation. How are you living this out in a disciple-making way with your fellow members? How are we investing in the building of relationships across generations within the life of the church? We don't have, as I said, little ones, teens, etc., but there, many of you have great talents and gay skills that could be utilized in other areas here. So reflecting just a moment silently as we just go through these points here, a healthy church provides the opportunity to strengthen relationships. Many of us do a little bit of connecting because we get we go out together after services for lunch. There are so many things I've learned about people going to lunch that I would never have learned otherwise. I mean, maybe there would have been dips and tips that would have happened through quick conversations. But when you're sitting at a meal, there's something at all about a meal and people share informally that you learn about people. And I feel I've deepened my relationships with a lot of people by going to lunch at what I consider a connect group. Are we making time for these deepening relationships are we making time for interaction between Sundays? I know I have not been that good at that because I know my personality is introverted. That would be shocked to most to think I'm an extrovert, but I am not. Um, so my, I have hesitancy to reach out and go in there because I always feel like I'm intruding. So I have to push myself to interact with people in between the Sundays. That's fine. Voice is not a connector. Are we deep in new relationships with cross generations? I remember I enjoyed those times when I went to Rosetta and Stevens in the summertime and hear the stories, et cetera. And I had always promised myself that surely Rosetta would teach me how to make that dish that she always did, that I always loved. I never pursued it, but I feel like that was a missed opportunity. For surely, I would be a better cook because I don't cook much now. 
So it, surely there's an opportunity there that I fail to miss. And maybe you might be thinking that there are those for you as well for our health church. So in summary, the Faith Avenue. The Faith Avenue is about the life of the church in between the Sundays. This is where <clears throat> discipleship occurs, growing in faith as we live out and allow Christ to express his faith in our lives and relationship. I am your Faith Avenue champion. Together, I hope we will explore ways to incorporate these concepts into our fellowship more in an open and respectful way. I will be open to all suggestions and comments. Thank you. So now I'm just going to switch quickly to the little worship calendar. So this has been kind of new for me in our, in our fellowship. I believe about a couple of years ago, the, our denomination introduced the worship calendar. Some of you may have seen this. If you've gone to GCI at all, you've seen this. It's sort of like a wheel here of some of the traditional types of seasons and things that are happening in our, in the Christian world. And the one that we're moving into now it's called Lent. Now, Lent is this old world word. It means lengthen. The days are getting longer. The lights are getting more light. So it comes from an old English word for lengthen. And Lent starts Wednesday, March 1st. You might have heard of it. It's also Ash Wednesday. Um, we do not do Ash Wednesday. We don't. The, the sisters, you know, something that our fellowship has done. Our denominational history is not of that, that nature. Um, I do remember being in college. I went to a, a, a Jesuit college and I had nothing, knew nothing about it. And there was a professor with, you know, a dot on his forehead. And I said, Professor, I think you've got something on your forehead. One way, but off. <laughs> Little did I know. Little did I know, you know, he'd just gone to, you know, his Ash Wednesday service. And of course, I had no clue what was going on. But anyway. Patient and, and grace was given to me. But in any case, <laughs> today is also, as you say, a transformation Sunday, which concludes the season of Epiphany. And if you recall, trans Transformation Sunday commemorates the occasion upon which Jesus Christ took all three disciples, Peter, James, and John, up to a mountain where Moses and Elijah appeared. And Jesus was transfigured. Transfigured is this word that denotes transformed into more beautiful, elated. I mean, Jesus was dazzling bright, so he was clearly transformed. Now, if you put Transfig Transfiguration sun Sunday and with everything that happened with the season of Epiphany, it's all about seeing God's glory. It's a season of seeing the mystery of God revealed in Jesus Christ. So now after this Transformation Sunday, we move, the Epiphany season moves away into the season of Lent, which we in GCI call Easter preparation. Which is a season of repentance, reflection, Whatever. And this is typically where we think about how all of this great birth of Jesus Christ has, has, has helped us, changed us, improved us. It's reflection. How can I be better? And it makes sense that it follows Epiphany. Because when something has been hidden, it's suddenly revealed, then one must change how they relate to the new reality. Your mind, our epiphany, puts us in a different place that requires us to change. And that is why Lent, or this Easter preparation, follows epiphany. And Transfiguration Sunday is the hinge story 
between the pages of an epiphany, naturally turning over into repentance and the story of our journey with the Lord towards Easter. So I don't know what you're going to do these next 40 days leading up to Easter, whether you do anything at all. It does help to have some way to reflect on these days leading up to Easter, or they'll just slam on you. Easter will just slam on you and you'll be like, oh, I've been hit by Easter. <laughs> you might want to do this a little more gracefully and a tool will help. You saw the email that you and I talked about. I said, I think we did this for um, Pentecost last year. It was all remote and all online when we were meeting strictly online, we gave you these little things to help connect us in this virtual world. There's nothing wrong with doing it again this time. Whether you use this wheel and you color each day and reflect, put a prayer, write, do nothing, or just think about it. It's just a way of you getting, you and the Lord communing and getting together. It's a prayer reflection tool. It's just a suggestion. You could use it as you move through the next 40 days of Easter. I've always had something that I do personally. I've done 40 days. Every day there's a devotional. I've done other things. Whatever suits you. This isn't a thus says the Lord type of moment. This is just suggesting that you try to do something. So you just don't crash into Easter. That's all. So that is it. Thank you so much.